Welcome to We Are Libertarians Daily. I am Chris Spangle doing a rare daily, but we're winding down the daily series. So everybody's life. Here's the thing about uh, having an ensemble produce content is you're, you're beholden to people's life cycles. And so as Hody and everybody else starts to get a little busier in their personal life, you know, to make money, uh, they are, uh, we are not going to be able to do a lot of dailies. And so this is one of the, the last dailies. We're still going to do them. We're just going to call them something different and maybe even move it over to another feed. But uh, we, we have not made all those decisions yet. We just know that we're going to stop calling it the daily at episode 100. Uh, and so uh, I am fortunate in, I think this is episode 90, it'll be 99 or 100, uh, maybe 98, to have Rimzo Martinez, who is one of my favorite libertarian podcasters and one of the few libertarians that I still get along with. <laughs> uh, so, Remzo, it's great to have you. Chris, it's always a pleasure. You know, you're going to get a lot of shit for saying that, uh, you know, I'm one of your favorite libertarian podcasts. So, um, for the last couple of years, people have always said, oh, is Remzo Martinez really a libertarian? And I guess recently that whole uh, that whole Twitter poll, like little tournament deathmatch thing, I oh. wasn't included on there, which I'm fine with because I don't typically really call myself a libertarian show anymore. But when that happened, I got a couple of DMs like, man, they're doing this to slight you or yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> You're not on there. So I was like, say la vie. Say la vie. I consider Mark Clare to be one of my best friends. On my Instagram, he is in my close friend circle. He gets to see the snaps no one else does. <laughs> Lions of Liberty never puts me in their Liberty draft. So – I, I get it. I understand exactly where you're coming. Oh, I've been bitching for three years about that. I know. I know. You're, we're both connected to that network, and they never add us. I mean, I defeated in a, in a Twitter poll. I defeated Ron Paul. I defeated Penn Jillette. I mean, my credentials are un. Uh, anyways, enough about us. But I, I have to start scalping people. I was just Break saying that nap. last night to somebody. The, the older I get, I'm, I'm now into a decade of being a libertarian, and the longer I go at this, the more radical I become in my libertarianism and my beliefs, and the less I have interest in being a part of the libertarian movement. Uh, it, it continues to grow. We just, we're in the middle of an argument with the LNC who said, no, nah, we don't No, I, I took exception to Stapleton and Mance and all these people go, oh, we're joining the Libertarian Party. It's like, okay, cool. I've been here the entire time and few outlets have promoted the LP as much as Wall has. And the LNC refuses to share our debates that we've done that nobody in the history of the party has ever given these candidates, which in my opinion are kind of undeserving of the attention, uh, a platform to do these debates. And the LNC doesn't want to share it because of poor production quality. Uh, you know, and it's just like, we're like, you're worth $15 a month on a zoom account to we are libertarians in terms of the audience your candidates are bringing us we're doing you a favor. Like don't pretend that you're doing us a favor by sharing this content I think they just don't want to actually show off the candidates but it's just little stuff like that where you just go. Why am I even helping any of these people like the libertarian movement is just a lot of grief for little payoff. I, you know, it's so strange that you bring this up because I was having a very similar conversation with somebody about that last night because very early on in my political career, you know, I was explicitly a big L libertarian. I'm pretty sure like maybe other than you, I mean, definitely I'm, I'm nowhere close to where you've been in terms of your involvement with the LP and campaigns and such as, but I think maybe other than you, I'm the only other uh, libertarian podcaster, so to speak, that has actually worked on more than maybe a dozen libertarian campaigns openly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my involvement with them stopped around late 2015, early 2016. And since then, uh, you know, I've drifted more from, you know, having like an explicit libertarian opinion to things and just trying to trying to really figure out like, what do I personally believe? And, you know, it's one of those things where, whenever you say something publicly that somebody doesn't like, they always try and say, Oh, you're, you're a neocon, you're a communist, you're not a libertarian, but you know, it's been less of a, Oh, what am I doing to become more libertarian? It's what am I doing to express more truth in my own life? Mm. And you know, I, I got some grief uh, recently. I was doing a debate with a friend of mine, Andrew Meyer, uh, the don't tase me bro guy. And I, I said on there, like I have, I'm not against right to work, but I, 
understands opposition to right to work. Right. Because, you know, I'm in, I'm in Virginia, you know, Virginia and even West Virginia coal miners, you know, just seeing it up close, I understand why they had to unionize in terms of unions that do evil. They really don't do a lot of the things that we associate with more, um, you know, uh, manufacturing country unions. So like to a certain degree, I'm like, why would we put right to work in West Virginia or Virginia when they're not really doing much of anything to stop the daily flow of productivity or they're not causing problems for people and they just want to make sure they're not getting black lung. Right. Like I get it because let's be honest, folks, you do right to work. Collective bargaining basically doesn't work anymore. So I'm not against taking away someone's right to collective bargain just so somebody else can get a job somewhere where they know it's going to be strong union. So that's my opinion on it. I'm not very set on it, but that was just my concern. I can express, I have a concern and immediately people start freaking out. So it's been less about, you know, what, what do I believe is the best libertarian answer? It's more about what do I believe is the best answer from my view on things. I think more people just need to come to that individualist point. Maybe it's a spiritual journey. Maybe it's a lot of different things. Well, but, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's difficult because when you're like, I'm, I have never built myself as the person that like, if you listen to me, like I'm working this stuff out myself and I'm bringing you along in the conversation I have with myself and others. I, I'm not as sure as Roger Paxton, for instance, about almost anything. And so that's, you know, it's kind of an ongoing dialogue as, and I think if you start at episode one in 2012 and work your way forward, you'll hear me kind of evolve more towards anarchism, you know, in a, in a lot of different ways. And I think that's just the intellectual journey that most people go on. And to pretend that you're, you know, the Mark Levin of libertarianism and you're just sure about everything and you're right on everything, I feel is dishonest. And, and so, but we live in an era where if you want to be good at content creation or opinion making, uh, you've got to be sure, you've got to be declarative, you've got to be Donald Trump, basically. And it's really tough. And it, and it really, I've noticed in the decade that I've been around libertarians, it's, it's slipped into tribalism in the way that the other two parties have as well. And, you know, I, I think somebody like Ron Paul actively courts uh, a cult-like mythos around him. I, you know, I'm not criticizing Ron Paul in really like we're about to get so much Ron Paul grief on Twitter I, but that's the point is that you can't be critical of Ron Paul surrounding himself with people like Daniel McAdams without people assuming that you hate Ron Paul I don't I'm personally a libertarian because of Ron Paul I respect a lot about Ron Paul but there are things about that individual human being that there are concerns and if you say that out loud, the cult of Paul, which I really take exception with the cult around him, not so much about the man, you say that and it's just, I mean, the, the, the tribal pockets in, in this movement of free thinking individuals is really stunning. And it's only gotten worse in the last couple of years. Uh, and I personally hate it. That's why we've always done the dear leader character here on We Are Libertarians is to make fun of that whole mentality. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, like Daniel McAdams, for instance, I think he's creepy as hell and there's something fishy about him and he's beneath Ron Paul and I don't know why he surrounds himself with that guy. So and this is, yeah, I mean, this is some inside baseball stuff and I'm, I'm going to try and parse my words correctly because I don't want anything to be misconstrued. But just like uh, any major figure... I mean, it's, they're going to be misconstrued, so I might as well not give them the ammo for that. But, like, you know, there, there are people around the Paul family itself who are there to profit from them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those people come in many shapes and sizes and different agendas. But, I mean, I, I experienced something very similar in 2016 when I was really kind of starting to kind of launch, so to speak. Um, I, I was very critical of Rand Paul. Not because I didn't believe that Rand Paul was like the perfect libertarian messiah, but because there were just some parts of his campaign and stuff where I was like, this isn't going anywhere. So I don't think people should waste their time. Um, I was probably as blunt as that earlier. I'm like, Rand Paul's not going to be the nominee. He's not going to be anywhere close to that. Just stop wasting your time. And, you know, I was right. I don't like being right about certain things, but I was right. And around the time that he dropped out and the Virginia primary was coming around, you had a bunch of Rand Paul supporters that were saying, Rand's on the ballot, still vote for Rand. So what I did to kind of mock them was I did the uh, Walk with Scott campaign 
which was to get people to vote for Scott Walker. Because I'm like, if you're going to vote for somebody that's dropped out, you might as well vote for somebody who dropped out and might actually realistically have a chance of winning. <laughs> and um, they didn't like that. They didn't like that. And well, that, you know, that happened with Ron Paul in eight and 12. You know, you, you had all these Ron Paul supporters, you know, well, it's still not over. We can go to the convention to go guys face reality. It's over. Like he, he hasn't dropped out yet. He's just, the, nothing is going to happen at the convention because the Republican party completely like here in Indiana, they removed 300 delegates to the national convention to keep Ron Paul supporters. Like that was for me, the moment when I go, okay, this is this working inside the party is not viable. And unfortunately yeah. I've gotten to the point where working outside the party through a third party is not viable. And so I'm just politically. I, I, I really wonder if this has been like a recent thing or if this has always been the case, because I almost want to go back to 1968 and meet those people who are, I'm sorry, 1964 and meet those Henry Cabot Lodge supporters. <laughs> They're like, Henry Cabot Lodge is still going to show up to the 64 convention. And it's like, I, I, I don't know if this is a, you know, more symptomatic or more causatic or, or what have you, but. Um, you know, and I, I've been listening to your show since I was living in Alabama in 2013. And hold, I before you praise me, hold that thought. Go back and read about Eugene Debs and his presidential runs for the Socialist Party in the early parts of the 1900s. And you see the Libertarian Party through all of it. I mean, it's just the human condition. Like, Oh, it's funny. It's, it's funny. funny. And, you, and you look at, um, uh, I think his name was Henry George. He was the first vice president to FDR. Um, Henry Wallace or something. I forget his yeah, name, but like Henry Wallace. Yeah. A vice president, Henry Wallace, who ran as a socialist years later, like he was dealing with the same thing. Like, honestly, him and Gary Johnson share a lot of strange personal traits, yeah. like their little mannerisms, their tics, the way they talk. Like they're, they're almost like the identical person. A really good documentary to watch is um, the, the secret history of the United States on Netflix and uh, I mean, it's it kind of goes off the rails at certain points because the untold history, it's the a, untold history. Who 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 did that? Who narrated that? Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone. Like Oliver Stone does a terrible job past the Vietnam War, but his history of the of of the progressive movement in the United States, even though he's telling it from a obvious progressive viewpoint, his 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 uh, retelling of the progressive movement in the United States is actually the most accurate I've ever seen. It's, it's you have to start at episode 11 because it's out of order, but it is, I've said for years, go watch that. I mean, it's, it's a Howard Zinn look at history, but I think it's, you see the origination of the Cold War and how destructive it was and, you know, kind of fact checking stuff. It's all pretty solid. Yeah. You didn't learn it because we're, we're indoctrinated into this idea that war is good. I mean, so, so back to you listening to the show when you were in Arkansas, is that what you I was in, I was going to Marion Military Institute in Alabama. And on Fridays when they would release the Corps of Cadets, I would drive two and a half hours to Tuscaloosa. So I would typically get through one and may, or maybe two wall episodes during that time. Okay. All right. And uh, I mean, with, with you, uh, you know, this, you know, call, call a praise to dear leader, but you know, I, I have seen that evolution over the years. And this is why I've always strongly called myself when I started transitioning to more of a journalism phase of my life. I always said, um, you know, I'm more of a journalist, not necessarily a pundit, because a journalist at least gives me the opportunity to go experience things, to go learn things, to go investigate things and change my mind. Whereas I feel like, you know, our, our modern pundit complex doesn't allow that or else you're committing, you know, career suicide. And um, why I've always called myself an opinion journalist. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I was raised in the media and, and uh, as a reporter and uh, high school newspaper, even back when I was a wee lad. And so while I worked for the Libertarian Party, it was, it was utilitarian. It was to give me a, a set of experiences that I could inform my opinion making. Because this has always been my destination is to understand like try to understand everything and wrestle through things and have it have an open mind to things and understand that the world is flexible and i agree i think to be i've always said that if i were the libertarian tommy lauren or if i you know you look at like eric july's rise for instance or or you know not not to criticize these two people but mance raider and eric july have had very successful rises because they cater to an ideology and it and it tickles the ears of the people that follow that ideology. I mean, it's not a criticism. It's just, it's, 
how they how they choose to do their show it's not good or bad it just is what it is and I, I've always said that if I did that, that I'd probably be a lot more popular than I am. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I look at myself, for example, and it's always been giant rises and drastic falls. Yeah. And I, I don't regret that because no one can say I haven't been consistent in being willing to change my mind on things. And one of the, one of the, one of the moments, yeah, I think, in 2017 that really – really kind of shocked me was I live in a pretty affluent area of Northern Virginia. It's where all the defense contractors live, where all the federal employees live. Like it's a pretty well-to-do area. And I, I went to this little town fair and uh, not, not to get too far into it, but I was investigating Eric Holder uh, running a giant anti-gun fundraiser movement in Virginia around the time for the Virginia gubernatorial race. Right. So I'm going to this fair and I'm talking to Democrats and everybody. I'm just trying to get their opinion on whether or not they are okay with Eric Holder, the guy who as acting attorney general gave automatic unregistered assault, I'm sorry, automatic unregistered weapons to the Sinaloa drug cartel lecturing gun owners on gun safety. <laughs> and no one knew who he was, but what I did to really ensure that they were telling me the truth was I would ask their opinion on that situation and Eric Holder. And they would give me this long emotional diatribe then I would either show them a picture of uh, Angelina Jolie's dad, you know, old white actor. Right. Say, uh, John Voight. Yeah, uh, him, John Voight. So I would ask, is this Eric Holder? And they would say, yeah, that's Eric Holder. <laughs> or, they w or I would just ask them, do you know who Eric Holder is? And they'd be like, no. Hmm. So it's sad because this, is, this isn't necessarily something from the top down affecting people. I think it's a, it's a very human issue because people would rather go down – saying something wrong that they want you to think they believe in and they will go down fighting a lie till the very end rather than say they don't know something. Right. And that scared the living crap out of me because this was also two weeks after the Las Vegas shooting and there were some possible loose connections to Eric Holder and the shooter in that case. Right. But uh, that, that really showed me. It's like, here I am talking to people twice, three times my age about someone who was one of the most controversial attorney generals for six years under the Obama administration. And they don't know who he is. Right. But they're trying, but they want their five seconds of fame so they can be in a magazine or a newspaper or something. So that way they can show it off to their friends and call themselves an expert or something. Exactly. It really bothered the living crap out of me. Well, there's... <sighs> Here's the thing that you learn working in the media. I've learned, I've, I, like I work at a high level running social media for a big national brand. And you're about to see this as uh, you have been hired by the Washington Times. Congratulations. Thank you. You run social media and you are about to become as cynical and depressed as I am. <laughs> because what you realize is individually people are very stupid and selfish and you you kind of see a little bit of what a lot of i mean you really see why libertarianism is the only path because people are very selfish and very self-interested um as as a whole as an audience as a collection there's a wisdom of crowds that see through bs that really can identify you know if you if you have a a, a show like mine for instance and something's going wrong with the co-hosts or there's a, a, a tension, the audience as a whole sees that and they're not afraid to tell you about it. You know, it, it's, it's why we all look at Kamala Harris and go, wow, she is a liar. But that Marianne Williamson, she seems genuine. She's got some dragon energy. <laughs> she, she, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give her a dollar so she can keep hollering after this. <laughs> she is, I tell you what, you watch Williamson because she's got that Trump thing where she's kind of crazy, but she exudes vulnerability or, or seriousness and sincerity in a way that maybe she's full of crap, but I think she's going to be attracted to people. But neither here nor there, you really start to see um, – I, I, just, I just think that people don't – people just kind of repeat what they hear, and they don't apply a lot of critical thought to what they're saying – and so something like the border, for instance, you really start to see, like, you're not, you're not even arguing, like, the argument that I've had about the, the, the border and, and the things that are happening to children there, we're not arguing about immigration. We're arguing about whether or not you think a child deserves to go to the bathroom in a clean toilet 
a blanket, a bed that isn't flea ridden, that's carrying typhus. Like, do you believe that a child in custody deserves to go see a doctor if they're sick? Well, they shouldn't have come here. Well, that's neither here nor there. They're going to come here. Like, it's the free flow of labor, just as you can't stop the free flow of capital with taxation or tariffs, you can't stop the free flow of labor. So like, what's your solution? Because clearly torturing children isn't a solution. Well, and then you just get a bunch of boomer talking points that I've heard on talk radio forever. And they never really click on the link to look at the pictures of what's happening to children. They never really care because it's, it's like they just settle back into their talking points. I mean, I find it personally disheartening to see people arguing about the wrong things when really it's about prisoner rights and not about immigration. I, I find this whole border thing to just be very distressing and hard to talk about, frankly, Remzo. Uh, I mean, you know, when it comes to topics like this, it's never about the humanity. It's always about the winning side. Um, this past year at the Advocates for Self-Government, I've written quite often about um, the, uh, the Japanese internment camps during World War II which was, uh, you know, something that we almost never talk about in our history classes in neither uh, K through 12 education or even American universities. And often I, I'm seeing like the worst of humanity come out in the comments section when it comes to those pieces, because you see so much racial animosity, so much, uh, you know, boomer nationalism kind of pop out, it becomes disgusting. But, you know, when it comes to the border issue, I think this is why I have never really largely been accepted by more uh, Republican circles because you know it I, I don't really i don't really stick with them like like here's a little inside baseball folks if you want to be a very influential young republican be a latino because okay. all you have to do is show up to place a smile and be seen in pictures with white candidates and you'll be a celebrity overnight you don't have to do crap there's but, a guy here that i'm thinking of that eventually ran for congress who his name's diego and he uh, man if you are a black republican Especially one that wears a cowboy hat. Oh, if you if you're black and Republican, oh. like I, I have black Republicans to tell me this, they hate the tokenization of minorities in the Republican Party. It's almost it's like honestly, I want to say it's almost more offensive than if you were to try and be a black Democrat because it's almost expected. But right. when you go and you go be a Republican, you're really if you're a minority and you're a Republican and you're trying to get really into Republican politics, they will force feed you crap. And you are not allowed to be an individual in that sense. And the moment you step out and say anything that sounds like an authentic idea, they will smash you down. But, uh, you know, like I, I came from a border town in Arizona called Sierra Vista. Growing up, it was around 2,500 people at the most, 3,000 since, uh, you know, the housing boom before the crash in 08 and onward. Now it's almost about uh, half a million people to a wow. certain point. So I've seen that escalate. And growing up, like growing up, this was the beginning of a lot of border issues, but it never had anything to do with economic migrants or people just coming over just to work. It was the rise of really the cartel nation. And America's very uncomfortable talking about the cartels in any serious way, because the truth is that America has created the cartels. Right. And, you know, my mother has grown up in Sierra Vista since, um, since the seventies. She, she was born and raised in Korea until she was 12 and then she came to Sierra Vista. My, my grandfather was a uh, army finance corps. He retired there and then he worked as a DOD civilian for Fort Pachuca outside of Sierra Vista. And she used to tell me, yeah, uh, my parents and all the neighborhood parents would just drive into Mexico, go shopping, go eat dinner, and then just come back and they'd see Mexicans coming into the US to work and then they'd go home. Right. Like none of them want to live here. They didn't want to live here. They just wanted to work here because the money was better then they go home. Like it was nice and fine. The border was basically open. The problem is that because of the American drug craze, you know, why is it that the money and guns are going one way, but the drugs are going the other way? When you look at, you know, this economic migrant situation, like, do, do I, do I think that's kind of bad in a way? Like, yeah, like this is, this is not helping, but to a large degree, we've managed to get to this point where we have no real understanding of what's going on the border because we fail to address the violence that is being inflicted by the drug cartels. Um, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I can send you story after story about beheadings mm -hmm. and they're just, they're literally lobbing heads into Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. 
um, you know, I had a cousin and her husband living in Fort Bliss and you look outside Fort Bliss into El Paso and you see a makeshift, a makeshift fence between the US and Mexico. And it looks like a third world country. And you ask people there, like, was it always this bad? It's like, well, you know, there's always been to a degree, you know, pretty bad poverty in Mexico, but never got to the point where people are afraid to walk near there. They weren't ever afraid to go near it. Uh, and it's because of, you know, kidnappings to sell people for drugs or for passage into the United States. I mean, the, the drug problem is, a, is by and in itself an American creation and has spread throughout this entire border debate. But we're never going to talk about it because we don't want to take blame for anything. Yeah, we don't want to take responsibility. And I think that's why people don't click on the photos or the videos or the articles about the stench and the disease that these kids are living in because they don't want to look at the results of their policy. And, and so much of what my work has been and will continue to, to increasingly be is the human cost of public policy. And people don't like to look at, at the end result of their policy. Like if you don't like what's happening to the kids at the border, like that's closed borders, like closing off the ports to asylum seekers and just shoving them back into Mexico where they're killed by violent gangs and, and caging them until you can transfer them back to Mexico. Uh, I mean, this is the result of closed borders. Like, if you don't, if you don't like what you're seeing, this is more government. You know, so it, it is. It's it's hard to look at at what you have advocated for and and the direct result and how it costs lives and how it costs. But that's just if you if you want to use the government to achieve any end, then here you go. Like, and this is why this is why to a certain degree I was really kind of happy when Ted Cruz and Donald Trump were addressing El Chapo and the Sinaloa drug cartel. I think, you know, both of them were going at it kind of different ways. Ted Cruz to a certain point was talking about drug reform and certain drug legalization, stuff like that. Whereas Donald Trump was like, we're just going to kill everybody. And I'm like, well, you know, that's a bad idea, but that's the worst bad, but that's the best worst idea they have. At least he's talking about the cartels. No one talks about the cartels in presidential debates. No one, I, I bet no one's going to talk about that this go around. And it bugged me in 2016 because they're talking about ISIS more than anything. Am I saying that ISIS wasn't a problem? No, but foreign policy in Syria and, and Iran and Afghanistan and Iraq really has nothing to do with the fact that there are Americans getting killed in the U.S. border. There are right. Mexicans getting killed on the Mexican-U.S. border. These cartels are literally in our backyard but we don't want to say anything about them because then we're going to have to do a lot of, you know, introspective searching and realize, Oh crap, we might have something to do with this. All right. So we're almost out of time, but are you still raising money for your next book? I am. So what I'm doing right now is I'm doing an Indiegogo campaign for my next book, How to Succeed in Politics and Other Forms of Devil Worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. I mean, the, the great thing about it is we already met our Indiegogo goal, but the campaign is up for another 40 days. So at this point we've met the goal. So a lot of people are just opting in for the discounts. You're saving up between a 25, 45 and 50% on most of the perks that include signed copies of my first book, signed copies of the next book, signed limited edition posters, and even a credit in the acknowledgements of the book. So now it's just a great sign for people to lock in, you know, kind of like a pre-order situation before the book is actually available on August 30th. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. Well, so is there a link? How do we get to it? Send it to me. I'll put it in the show notes, but yeah. tell people where they can follow you online. Yeah. Just go ahead and check out everything at rwmartinez.com. Everything is there. Find me on Facebook at Remso W. Martinez and on Twitter at Remso for F-O-R-V-A, Remso for V-A. All right, everybody. Thank you, Remso, for joining us. And thank you to our audience for listening. And uh, any final thoughts, Remso? Check out the book, folks. If you're afraid of what's going off the government, you want to learn about this political consultant class, which I believe has made everything so much worse. You're going to love my book coming out on August 30th, Hask Seed in Politics and Other Forms of Devil Worship. All right, Rimzo, thanks. And uh, we will see everybody tomorrow.